biological drugs are revolutionizing medicine. Pandemic. Global pandemic. 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 Our understanding of how biological systems target the outside of cells curtailed a pandemic saving millions of lives. We've all heard of the term pandemic, but what does it actually mean? But even the most capable medicine is only as good as its ability to find its target within the body. And most of those targets don't live on the outside of the cell, but on the inside, protected behind our cell membranes. What possibilities could be unlocked if we could tame one of our natural enemies, viruses, flooding our bodies with a swarm of cancer-seeking sentinels set to hunt down and deliver medicine where it's needed most? If they can achieve it, this could be the future of medicine as envisaged by a scientific team spun out of the University of Warwick, Nano Syrinx, where in a single thread of biological information, not only is the medicine and treatment payload encoded, but also the nano machinery required to successfully deliver the medicine to exactly where it's needed in our bodies, destroying cancer, eliminating disease, and acting as the next great leap forward in medicine. Today we're looking at possibly one of the most important capabilities for fighting disease, our ability to actually smuggle medicines to where they are needed before our body's natural defenses wipe them out. We've looked before at oncolytic viruses, viruses that naturally infect and kill cancer, and how companies like Immugene are genetically enhancing these viruses to make them even better at their jobs. This is a different approach. How do we assemble viruses that contain medicine payloads and train them to deliver those payloads to the heart of the cells where they are most needed? To set the scene though, I want to first talk about why getting things into the cell is so difficult in the first place. The pillars of traditional medicine have historically been small molecules. Small molecule drugs are defined as compounds with low molecular weights that are capable of modulating biochemical processes to diagnose, to treat, or to prevent diseases. Small molecule drugs that you might have heard of include aspirin, paracetamol, diphenhydramine, which is an antihistamine for my fellow allergy sufferers out there, and other molecules that we typically have in our medicine cabinets. Lots of naturally discovered compounds that have medical properties are small molecules, a classic example of which is the wonder drug penicillin, discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming when penicillium mold spores landed in a petri dish and prevented the growth of the bacteria that he was studying. As penicillin circulates through your body, it finds and binds to penicillin binding proteins, PBPs, located inside of the bacterial cell wall, essentially deactivating them. Inactivation of these binding proteins interferes with the bacteria's ability to build a strong and rigid cell wall. The weakening of that cell wall makes the bacteria less robust in its environment, ultimately causing it to die. Now this always seemed to me like an amazing quirk of nature, a tiny molecule that finds and exploits one tiny Achilles heel to bring an entire cellular mechanism crashing to its bacterial knees. All right, we call it a draw. That, however, is exactly the power of a small molecule. Their relatively low molecular weight and simple chemical structures means that they can slip almost effortlessly through cell membranes. However, their simplicity is also potentially their major limitation. Only about 10% of the genome can be targeted by small molecule drugs. With a moveset that is limited to bind or block, the curiosity of humanity to be able to edit or even rewrite problems within our very genetic code that defines us needs a more complicated or capable instrument. Small molecules took us a very long way, but to deliver truly sophisticated therapies to the human body, we needed to turn to more tunable systems, to use biology itself. Biologics are anything biological in nature, which I appreciate is a bit of a recursive definition. Things like sugars, proteins, nucleic acids, or any complex combination of these components make up biologics or biological therapies. We are at the dawn of the biological 
era. In 2016 alone, eight of the top 10 global best-selling drug compounds were biologics. The increased complexity of form and function of biologicals allows them to target more complicated actions, like recognizing a particular protein present on a cell membrane and only delivering their chemical payload to a certain cell within the body. Another example is VEGF. When tumor cells are growing quickly and need greater blood supply to fuel their growth, they send out VEGF to stimulate blood vessel growth. We can fight this request using a biological therapy called Bevacizumab that binds to and blocks VEGF, preventing blood vessel growth and also disrupting further growth of the tumor. Biologicals present one of the most powerful tools ever harnessed by medicine, working with the very fabric of life itself to prevent or cure diseases. With this increasingly sophisticated biological machinery, there is, however, one huge underpinning problem with biological medicines. Their complexity and fragility means most of them are destroyed before making their way to their target, or they are simply too large to make it across the cell membrane. But to put simply, what good is a cure if you can't administer it? The reality is that 10 to 20% of promising new medicines fail to get through clinical trials because they get wiped out by the body and never reach their targets in the first place. Sometimes we counter this by increasing the dosage, more medicine in the body, maybe some of it will reach the end location. But this approach, which you might affectionately refer to as spray and pray, has consequences. Increasing the concentration of a therapy above the therapeutic window, the safe concentration a drug can be administered at, causes side effects, killing or damaging otherwise healthy cells, tissues, or organs. So the question becomes, how do we get large complex pieces of biology into the right cell at the right time to do the job that they have been sent to do? CEO Dr. Joe Healy thought, why not take inspiration from nature itself? So the inspiration um, fundamentally just comes from, you know, borrowing from nature, doing what it does best. The, the, the system we've come across is, is an example of nature solving this problem of putting biologic payloads across membranes. Um, you know, we've learned time and time again that nature is pretty good at these things. Evolution tries a lot of different approaches, and this is one of the best ones we've come across. We have medicines created by nature, both in small molecules and in biological forms. Why don't we make better use of nature's machinery itself to deliver the medicine? Viruses are perfectly designed to infiltrate the body latch on to cell membranes and deliver a payload into the cell's cytoplasm that hijacks the cell's means of production and begins replicating in the host. The virus-like particles that the team is working on is part of a bacterially derived phage system, which essentially means a virus that is made by a bacteria. Similar to how we borrowed CRISPR from bacteria, this is another capability that some bacteria have to assemble virus-like particles loaded usually with a toxin that they fire out at targeted host cells as a virulence factor, which means there's something to help that bacterium colonize the host at a cellular level. This system naturally has a number of really interesting advantages. Because it's bacterially derived, we can use bacteria to produce it. Using standard E. coli fermentation processes, E. coli become therapeutic virus factories, fitting into existing biopharma manufacture processes to keep costs down and produce these particles at sufficient scale. The genetic code that bacteria use to produce these factors is a small circular DNA loop called a plasmid often found in bacteria and some other microscopic organisms. Plasmids are physically separated from chromosomal DNA and usually replicate independently of the wider organism. This plasmid in particular doesn't just encode for the payload, but also for all the other pieces of the virus-like particles, meaning that the whole system can be built in roughly a single step. By using something like CRISPR or other gene editing approaches, that original payload can be cut out and replaced with different therapies, making the system into a platform capable of delivering many different therapeutics. The feature that makes viruses quite so exciting as a vector are their binding arms that help them to identify and attach to target cells. 
As different cells exhibit different surface proteins, this could mean that medications are delivered only to the cell that would need them, eliminating off-target effects and side effects that we see in treatments like chemotherapy. These arms can also be switched in and out to match the binding site, making the system pretty close to a designer solution. While the virus chassis not only protects the delicate biological therapy from damage until it reaches the cell, but is also designed with a cell penetrating spike, which through the tail contractile mechanism, penetrates the cell membrane and releases the payload into the cell, where it can have its intended therapeutic effect. I asked Joe how this approach compared to other cutting edge technologies. Uh, it varies from payload to to payload, but generally the most common ones you'll come across will, will be things like antibody conjugates, liposomes, and more recently exosomes as well. Exosomes and liposomes at least have the capacity to support the size of payload. Um, but again, you, you fall into all sorts of different issues depending on the, the, the modality you're talking about. Um, with liposomes and exosomes, there's no inherent targeting to the system, so you don't necessarily have as much specificity. With antibodies, the thing you're conjugating is exposed to the environment, so you risk degradation. Um, so there are pros and cons to, to all these different approaches, and there isn't a kind of one-size-fits-all. Um, but we hope our system is uh, as much of a one-size-fits-all uh, solution as there can be uh, to this challenge, um, as it has you know various kind of critical advantages, we think, over each of those different challenges. It's important always with these cutting edge technologies to ask what are the potential drawbacks. Obviously with any foreign material entering the body, the body's immune system will try its hardest to fight it off. This might mean that the body's natural immunities limit the use of a particular version of this virus system to a single use in a patient before ultimately it may need to be re-engineered to still be effective with that particular individual. So the, the, the double-edged sword of being a biologic is that you might get these responses in the first place, but we have you know, genetic control of every single amino acid in that structure potentially. I mean, we're talking about 10 megadaltons of protein, so a lot of protein in a particle where we can theoretically control every single amino acid in, in that structure um, and engineer out antigenic sites or, or other you know other issues you might have with with um, any of the structural proteins etc. As the culturing of these viruses occurs within E. coli, you also won't see these particles replicating in the human body, unlike with oncolytic viruses that target, reproduce in and then kill cancer cells, releasing their offspring into the blood supply to seek out further cancer cells. For nanosyrinx, this means treatments may need to be administered multiple times, depending on the efficacy of that treatment. This does, however, mean that we won't see these viruses jumping person to person or spreading in a flu-like capacity, which probably is a Pandora's box we shouldn't open at the moment. When I talked to Joe, he really stressed that they are still very much at the beginning of this journey. In July of 2021, they announced a 6.2 million pound seed round, which is a huge seed funding round for a UK startup company. So it shows the level of interest that there is in this technology platform. That funding is to understand and improve the platform as a whole beyond which they will start to identify which are their first disease indications that they want to try and tackle. What I think is absolutely amazing about this technology is that it is at a point where treatment and delivery mechanism are indistinguishable. It's as close as I think we will come in the near future to purpose-built nano machinery to circulate around our bodies and hunt down disease. Injecting the capability of biologicals into a biological machine to target and infiltrate our own cellular biological machinery, I think if this is successful, it could absolutely be an industry redefining technology where 50 years from now, we can't imagine how primitive our previous approaches to medicine really were.